righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Welcome everyone, and if you've joined me on Sunday, happy Palm Sunday. I'm glad you're with me. We're going to read some scripture, a couple of scriptures, Matthew 21 and also Philippians chapter 2. So you might want to get your Bible open for these scriptures. <clears throat> As most of us know, Palm Sunday begins what we call Passion Week or Holy Week. Many Christians around the world will be reading scripture, some of the scripture that we're reading today. They'll be reading the scripture and um, a lot of the other scriptures that lead up to his crucifixion. I encourage you to look in the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four include um, scripture that uh, tells of Jesus' death, his resurrection. We're going to, this first scripture we're looking at, Matthew 21, is when Jesus enters into Jerusalem as king. He was on his way to the cross, and he knew what would happen there where he willingly laid down his life. So let's read this together, Matthew 21, verse 1. 
As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. When you think about this, this action of Jesus seemed to be out of character for him. For usually he would, would withdraw from the crowds when they clamored for his attention. I re, I'm thinking of one occasion when I know that he hid from a crowd because they wanted to make him king. But his, he said, um, he said, this is not my time. Um, they wanted to force him to do something that he knew wasn't right for him then. And so when he entered in Jerusalem, he entered in a way that would bring attention to himself, for now his hour had come. And as we read earlier, he went through Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. If he rode a horse, that would have been considered a mount of war. But the donkey was a sign of peace. So when he, so when he claimed to be king, he claimed to be the king of peace. And, you know, just reminded of that wonderful scripture that we often look at um, at Christmas time, where Isaiah talked about Jesus, the Messiah, being wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So he came, he showed up not to destroy, but to love, not to condemn, but to help us. He came not in the, in the strength or of, of arms, of, in other words, of, of arms that where he could fight, but he came in the strength of love. And I think there would have been a joyous mood there in the crowd as the people anticipated the promise of the prophets before them. For as Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, I think that there would have been many Jews who would remember the prophecy of, of Zechariah 9, 9, which I read some of it um, just a few minutes ago from Matthew, where uh, Zechariah wrote, wrote, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So we noticed that there were songs of praise and excitement of the people around Jesus, with Jesus. And then we wonder, because we know the story, we know what's coming, and we wonder how did everything go from the beginning of Passover week on Palm Sunday with these shouts of Hosanna and people calling out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him, crucify him. Likely many of those voices, those same voices that praised Jesus as their king, denied him less than a week later and shouted for his execution like a common criminal. Never forget, you know, that uh, the devil came to Jerusalem. He, Satan showed up in full force that week, that day. Everything appeared to be lining up for Satan, for he had all his ducks in a row, but he had a problem because God had his plans too. Satan's goal was to kill Jesus and to stop the mission of Jesus, but God's goal again was for Jesus was also for Jesus to die. Why? You may wonder because only through the death of Jesus could the sins of the world be forgiven. Now I kind of wonder I I kind of like to imagine a little bit about who would have been in the crowd that day. Of course we know the disciples were there. But I wonder if some people that Jesus had already met were there in that crowd. Maybe some who had been healed by Jesus and maybe others that were there that had learned and at his feet had understood his teachings in the synagogues. 
Maybe there were some who were there that months before sat on a hillside listening to a teaching so amazing that they just couldn't bring themselves to leave. I wonder if there were some there in that crowd who had been there on the day when Jesus took loaves, five loaves, and two fish, prayed, gave thanks, and fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Maybe some of them were there that day. And then I wonder if that woman who'd been brought to Jesus by, the, by some of the leaders, the religious leaders of the day, she was caught in the act of adultery. And they brought her to Jesus to see what he would do. And Jesus didn't condemn her. He offered her forgiveness and told her to go and sin no more. Maybe she was there. Or maybe the man bl born blind, the man who had been uh, pray was praising there with er God with everything that he had, for now he could see. Or maybe one, I'm just thinking, still thinking about it. Maybe the man who was paralyzed and his four friends let him down through a hole in the roof. They put a hole in somebody else's house, their roof, let him down. Maybe that par formerly paralyzed man was just leaping and jumping for joy, praising God. Well, we don't know who was there, but we do know this. The people were celebrating their king. And in the excitement of their celebration, one by one, people began to do something that we find maybe strange. But they started to take off their outer garments and just lay them down on the road. A patchwork, if you will, of, of tattered and probably faded garments that became a royal carpet for their king. Have you ever been to a wedding where they lay down the carpet for the bride before she enters? I have been. I've, I've seen it different times. This carpet, I can remember it as red, but the carpet says to all who have been invited, the bride is the important one here. Sorry, grooms, but the bride. Often the middle aisle is blocked and the guests would just have to use the side entrances and side aisles to get to their seats. For the, the middle aisle, that one place it was reserved for the bride who would walk in honor towards her waiting groom. Well, we know that the people didn't have a royal carpet, but they improvised with what they had. So they laid down their cloaks and even began to strip off branches from the palm trees, spreading them on the road before Jesus. They had no idea that everything was going to be turned upside down and that the very one they were praising and celebrating would himself be spat upon, rejected, beaten, and tortured. The tide of change was fast approaching. The crowd may have laid down their cloaks, but their hearts was another matter. Jesus knew that they wanted a deliverer who would conform to their plans instead of their plans to his. They wanted Jesus, but on their own terms. They wanted Jesus to destroy their Roman oppressors, but they really didn't want Jesus to meddle in their personal lives, their pious and superficial religion. I want to change directions a little here now and look at what Jesus laid down for us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's it. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's a definition of love. I think um, now I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 2. I think this is one of the most beautiful and moving passages that the Apostle Paul ever wrote about Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to read for, beginning at verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus, as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
to the glory of God the Father. So just very briefly, I'm going to look at uh, some insights into who Jesus was. First thing that Paul mentions us, he says, Jesus in his very nature is God. In other words, his nature cannot be changed. It is who he is. He is God. Paul tells us that Jesus was essentially and unalterably God. And since he was innately and in, and in essence divine, he had no need to grasp for equality with God because Jesus, as God's son, is heir to all things and according to the right of Hebrews, an exact representation of God. Secondly, he made himself nothing. Jesus willingly set aside not his deity, but the glory of his deity, all his privileges to take upon himself humanity. This is the sacrifice of the incarnation. When we think about, we celebrate Jesus coming to us, the incarnation at Christmas time. This is God coming down to live among humanity as one of us. The founders of virtually every other major religion have taught their followers this. I'm a prophet who shows you how to find God. But Jesus taught his followers, I am God who has come to find you. Thirdly, he took the very nature of a servant. In John chapter 13, we see where Jesus was at the last meal he had with the disciples and where he served his disciples by washing their feet. He took upon himself the duties of a servant. Um, verse 3 in that chapter says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. And he showed us what it means to have a Savior who's a servant. Fourthly, he was made in human likeness. Not only did he take the form of a servant, but he was made in the likeness of men. Son of God and son of men. Five, he humbled himself. One of the great characteristics of Jesus' life was his humility. He renounced all his glory for the sake of the world. Six, he became obedient to death. Another hallmark of Jesus' life was his obedience. He modeled the life of obedience for us. He set aside his glory for all people. And even, number seven, he went even to death on a cross. He loved us to the extent that he would take the cruelest form of death that humanity, that humanity could think of. In conclusion, I want to remind you that Jesus gave his all for you and me. He laid down his life so that we could pick up our lives and live in a relationship with him. We can live without fear of the future, of what is happening in our world right now. We can put our trust in the one who gave his life for us, the one who has the nail-scarred hands. We can trust in the one who is resurrected, living and desiring a relationship with each one of us. His spirit is near us. His spirit is near you. So I encourage you today to just talk to him. If you have a relationship with him, praise God. But if you do not, and you know that you don't, why not just stop and talk to him right now about it? I listened to a video a few days ago, uh, Bill and Gloria Gaither. They're getting a little older now, I guess, as we all are. But they talked on their video about a song they wrote several years ago. I think most of us who have been around the church for a while have heard it, sung it, know it kind of inside out. A song that they wrote, Because He Lives, and it just... It just resonated in my heart this week as I listened to their testimony. They talked about, I think it was Gloria that shared this mostly. She said when their youngest child had been born, I don't know the date, but they there was something, Some the world just seems to be so much at a place of unrest. And they sensed this in their own spirit. They were deeply disturbed. And yet they sensed that God was calling them to write and to express their trust in him. And they wrote the first verse. It's the second verse in the, the song that we have. But it was the only verse they wrote <clears throat> at the beginning. And they said, how sweet to hold our newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance. This child can face uncertain days because 
he, Jesus, lives. In the chorus, he wrote, they wrote, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Trust in him. He lives. You can trust on him. You can start singing it if you want to. That song is a good song. So as I end this, this time, our time together, it's Holy Week. So why not direct your heart and your thoughts and mind to Calvary and be reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made for you? And may the Lord lead you to the place where he laid down his life, to Calvary. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you that you laid down your life for us so that we could have a life with you. We thank you, Lord, that in these times of uncertainty, you are certain. You are rock solid. You are unchangeable. And we can trust in you. I pray, Lord, that you will keep your church strong. That you will help us to stay focused on you to understand and to know that you walk with us through this storm. I pray, Lord, now that as we go into Holy Week, that you will help us as we read your word, We remember as we remember your sacrifice. Help us, Lord, to uh, be, uh, as we go to again to Calvary and look again at what you've done for us, to come through that with such a sense of awe and joy, and love for the one who gave us all for us. We just ask, Lord, that you would be with each one now. Keep your church strong. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus, the one with the nail-scarred hands, the one who gave us life for us. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. And we'll be together, hopefully, again on Easter Sunday.
Me.